However, by early 1945, even more extreme security measures were needed. On February 3rd, the Berlin Reichsbank was heavily bombarded. The bulk of the German gold and currency reserves were quickly transported to Merkur's salt mine, 200 miles southwest of the city. Soon, with the Russians closing in from the east, the museum curators asked to move their treasures to the west, toward the advancing Americans. Nearly everybody in Germany did know that the Russians had to have revenge. The Berlin curators had to believe, and really believe, if the Russians would get the material, it would go to Russia and never come back. Hitler resisted evacuating the artwork, believing the move displayed a defeatist attitude. But finally, on March 6th, he issued the order to move the art treasures underground to mines in central Germany. By the end of April, the Russians were overrunning the city. In the bunker, just days before his suicide, Hitler studied a model for his Linz Museum and dreamt of things that would never be. As the Allies made plans for the Normandy invasion, Europe's terrible loss of property and culture were not ignored. Eleven days before D-Day, General Eisenhower dispatched a message to all his field commanders that read, Inevitably, in the path of our advance will be found historical monuments and cultural centers which symbolize to the world all that we are fighting to preserve. It is the responsibility of every commander to protect and respect these symbols wherever possible. People in the art establishment in the United States managed to persuade uh, Roosevelt and the Army Command to assign a few officers who were mostly art historians, people who'd been at museums, to each army group uh, who would be responsible for buildings that they ran into on the way and also later on for movable works of art. This small team of American and British officers was called the Monuments, Fine Arts and Archives Group, or MFA and A. But their mission wasn't taken very seriously by the fighting army. At the time of the invasion, there could not have been more than maybe 10 MFNA officers in the invasion. Not more than that. They had no authority. They had never been issued a vehicle. They had no way of getting around. And naturally, uh, they must have appeared a little bit weird because most GIs could care less whether a painting was saved or not. Although their primary mission was finding and protecting lost treasures and bringing aid to historic buildings damaged by the Germans, one of their most difficult tasks was preventing Allied troops from causing further damage. One soldier said once that after you've been in a battle and you come into a beautiful chateau, then you just absolutely have to shoot at the chandeliers, I mean, just to blow off steam. But by the spring of 1945, one incredible discovery gave the MFA and A the respect it was looking for. On April 4th, General Patton's 3rd Army occupied the village of Merkers and learned the local salt mine could contain a substantial quantity of loot. On April 7th, a small group took the six-minute elevator ride 1,600 feet below the surface and discovered a treasure chest of unimaginable proportions. And at the bottom of the elevator is several truckloads of German marks. Well, then the first thing General Ernest said was, everybody put your hands in your pockets. I don't want anybody to steal any of this damn stuff. What lay before them was a maze of 35 miles of tunnels filled with 285 tons of gold bars and coins, over $520 million worth of Reichsmarks and foreign currency, 1,200 crates of priceless art, including works by Rembrandt, Raphael, Van Dyck, and Renoir. The Americans had captured more than 90% of the German gold and currency reserves, as well as masterpieces from 15 Berlin museums. 
what was so overwhelming was how big it was, how big it was, and how, you see, anything we ever knew would be you'd never keep portraits and other works of art with gold. You wouldn't keep currency with gold. You'd separate them out in a separate location. And here they were all together, you see. But the elation of the find was tempered by the discovery of rows of suitcases filled with personal possessions. The next vault was full of pails of eyeglasses. And somebody said, well, I guess we know where they came from. And that was the first realization that we had that the, undoubtedly all came from one of the concentration camps where they were putting the Jews to death. Then one of the vaults was filled with pails of false teeth, gold teeth and fillings, which kind of made you sick to your stomach because you also knew where they came from. The discovery at Merkers was of such significance that on April 12th, Generals Eisenhower, Bradley, and Patton all came to inspect the mine. Patton and I went to see it. Patton said, please, I, let's, let's, let's ship it back secretly to the States, and then when Congress starts cutting our appropriations after the war, we can finance ourselves. He was going to use it to finance the United States Army, which, I, you know, was a damn good idea. <laughs> Patton also had strong opinions about the artwork. He wrote in his diary, the ones I saw were worth, in my opinion, about $2.50 and are of the type normally seen in the bars in America. He was looking at paintings that included over 200 of the world's greatest masterpieces, valued at over $80 million. With the find at Merkers, the recovery of lost treasure became a goal for every army unit. But the Americans and British were now operating in the designated Soviet zone of occupation. Technically, this was Russian booty. However, on April 10th, a top secret order was issued by the State Department. All valuables found in the Soviet zone were to be brought immediately into the American zone for safekeeping. In mid-April, under intense security, the contents of the Merkers mine were transferred to Frankfurt and the rush was now on to find as much loot as possible before the Russians took over. Over the next several weeks, the U.S. Army unearthed hundreds of secret repositories packed with gold, silver, and currency, as well as hundreds of thousands of works of art. At Siegen Mine, they found the treasure of Charlemagne. In Nuremberg, they discovered the Austrian crown jewels. In the mountain near Mittenwald, they unearthed 728 gold bars. And at alt Alsay mine in Austria, they captured 7,000 paintings and 3,000 boxes of art objects destined for Hitler's Linz Museum. But one of the greatest scores in the hunt for art was when the 101st Airborne captured Goering's collection near the towns of Berchtesgaden and Unterstein. Goering had rushed his treasures from Karenhall south in two trains in order to keep them out of the hands of the Russians. Some of the valuables were hidden in a bunker, but many were pillaged by civilians before the Americans arrived. Those carloads at Understein were looted by German civilians, and they had an absolute feast. It was like ants crawling just to loot everything out of there. There were some elderly women that came in there to loot the train. The rugs were so large they wouldn't fit in their homes, so they tucked the rugs there and cut them in quarters so they could fit in their homes. And these were old 18th, 17th century rugs they were cutting up. His collection sort of scattered all over the town of Berchtesgaden. Also there was his curator, Walter Hofer, who uh, just acted as if nothing at all had happened. He greeted uh, the arts officers who were all museum people as if he'd seen them last week and he asked about friends in New York and <laughs> and he showed off the whole collection to uh, the press and he, he gave the impression that everything had been legally bought but he was quickly silenced and put in jail and the true story soon emerged but it was quite a performance. Later, at the Nuremberg trials, 
MFA and A investigators question Goering about the origin of his collection. Uh, a member of the MFA and A interrogated Goering. He obtained the satisfaction of being the one to break the news to Goering that the painting uh, that he most valued in his huge collection, the one that he'd actually paid money for, not just confiscated, that that painting was a fake. 